Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to day four of Pixapalooza. We're so glad to see that so many of you are sitting safely at home and you've decided to join us yet again for this fourth day. We'll be diving into the ins and outs of Pixatope. The topic of today is going to be product controls as well as all kinds of interactive logic within Pixatope. We are going to be looking at virtual camera moves. How do we fly around within a set without needing to move the tracked camera? We are going to be sort of doing a bit of a deep dive into basic blueprinting. How do we build logic? How do we make things move? Before we move on to streamlining logic, uh, we are going to be looking at our baseline event system, which can help you create complex virtual productions with tons of moving bits and pieces, all of it being accessible from a very intuitive interface. And towards the end, we're going to do a overview of data integration within Pixitope using our protobuf-based API. Uh, before we do too much of a deep dive, I just want to remind everyone of the fact that you can ask questions at any time. And we have a team of artists and engineers that will get back to you as soon as possible. You may, we will also go through all of these questions in plenum at the end of this session. Uh, please also note that you should be seeing three output feeds. I believe we are not currently showing this one. Can we show this one as well? So the big screen share, which uh, where you're currently seeing my slides, is a share of my left monitor. Uh, this one is going to be slightly more stuttery because as we all know there's quite a few people online these days so the big screen is going to mainly be for viewing the interface and seeing what i'm actually doing whereas the webcam feed on my side here is the actual sdi output feed from pixitope it's going to be slightly lower resolution but will have much better frame rate, and it's going to be easier to keep tabs of things moving around by looking at that particular feed. Okay, so before we move on, my name is Frank Daniel Movevic. I'm a senior product specialist at the Future Group. I'm joined here with my by my camera shy colleague, Magnus, sitting off to the side, dealing with all the technical hurdles, and together we're going to be walking you through this session. This is, as mentioned, is this is, as mentioned, day four of Pixabalooza. Here you can see we are going to be what we are going to be going through today. Before we, towards the latter half of Pixabalooza, we're diving into more and more technical subjects. So, without further ado, let's dive into Pixitope and start looking at level sequences. We've also added a, a key press widget here in the bottom right. So you should be able to see the hotkeys and buttons I push as I fly around and work within Pixitope. The set we're going to be working in today is going to be our Versailles set. It's uh, based on quite a lot of photorealistic assets, some photogrammetry, as well as gorgeous light set, uh, gorgeous light setup and light bake, ensuring we have a rather aesthetically pleasing Baroque set to work within today. What we're going to be doing is we are basically going to be making a virtual production from scratch. Uh, we're going to start with level sequences, doing some virtual camera moves to give us a nice way to enter this virtual set. We are then going to look at how we can use virtual camera moves to have a transition between two different positions. And then we're going to make a bar graph, allowing us to input some numbers from our Pixel control panel to drive graphics or a graph within Pixitope. So before we start diving into making this actual level sequence, let's take a look at what a level sequence actually is. We've spent quite a bit of time over the past few days looking at blueprints, which of course is a great way to make retriggerable, dynamic, procedural animations and logic. But it also is might not be the easiest way for someone starting out with Unreal. I'm just going to go ahead into my dev folder and make a new dev folder here to work in so we have a clean slate. Let's go ahead and call this. There we go. 
So we're going to go ahead and right click in the content browser and we're going to make a new animation level sequence. Now let's example. So a level sequence is something that most of you artists out there in the audience are going to be immediately familiar with. It is a timeline where we can animate properties, we can animate transforms, we can spawn objects, despawn objects. We can basically do anything that you might be used to from similar timeline based animation suits like Maya or within Blender or similar. Well, basically any kind of animation package which deals with moving or animating things over time. The way the timeline, the, the way the sequencer works is very simple. You can access anything in your scene on the fly. I can, for instance, go ahead and add a sphere. We can put that sphere with drag and drop into our level sequence, and then we can animate the transform properties over time. I'm going to shift it over to the side. I'm hitting enter just to add a new keyframe. And here we can see we've now made a simple animation. We can then start refining this. We can add more frames in between. And work iteratively building beautiful animations. We can also spawn things. We can hide things. We can animate pretty much any property which an actor possesses within this useful little interface. As you can see here, I could, for instance, start animating visibility. So it's a, pretty, it's a pretty easy interface to get familiar with. Okay, so we're going to immediately go ahead and create our virtual camera and start building our logic. Before we do that, let's just go ahead and fly over to the firewall just so we have a checklist of the things we're going to be doing today. Let's uh, see here. So our production that we're going to be building from scratch is going to have a ent entry move. See here. Okay, so I'm just gonna add a 3D text element and we are going to be looking at intro, we need an intro move. We are going to need a transition move. We are going to be needing a graph element. And then we should also spend a bit of time working with 3D text. Okay, so first of all, we're going to start with our intro move. We are going to be starting with a camera at the far end of this long hole. We're going to pull this back towards our talent position where we're going to blend into the tracked camera. So let's fly on over to the far side. We're going to go to the pixel tab underneath modes. We're going to drag in a virtual camera. For this session, we're going to build all our logic from scratch. Generally speaking, you should always try to have template blueprints that you can use for this sort of thing. So instead of always need to build things from scratch, you should instead have pre-made utilities that you can just recycle. It is always good to see how things work under the hood, which is why for this session, we will do everything from scratch. So as you can see here, tapping G to go out of hiding things in game view, we can see we have our virtual camera. I'm going to go ahead and save the level. And we're going to go ahead and add this virtual camera to our level sequence. Let's go ahead and rename it. This is going to be a level sequence, virtual move, Enter. The next thing I'm going to do is right click this virtual camera. I'm going to click pilot, which is going to allow me to fly the camera, so to speak, so I can easily set keyframes as I'm moving the camera looking through it. See here, I now snapped to looking through the camera. 
we are going to go to the very start of my sequence and add a transform keyframe. And, and then we're just going to start pulling a virtual move. So as you can see, I selected the transform tab and I'm just going to pull back, hit enter. And then we're just going to keep sliding backwards while adding more and more keyframes. Notice that as I'm pulling back, we can even see, let's see here, we can even see the path of the camera as it flies backwards. Allowing me to have a nice feel for what I'm actually doing here. Now this isn't going to be particularly beautiful. I'm not the world's best animator, but let's just take a look at what we've now gone ahead and made. So we're going to be going back to the beginning. I'm hitting space to do a playback. And here we can see our virtual camera move. You can see that we are having some issues with some spinny segments. Let's take a quick look at what happened there by going to the handy graph curve editor within the level sequence. So clicking this is going to give me a new interface over on the side. And this is going to be a very standard fair curve editor. By isolating out the rotational keys, you can see here that as we dip below minus 180, we're now suddenly snapping to plus 180. Uh, this is another thing that can happen when you're animating within Unreal, because the range of rotation tends to go from minus 180 to plus 180 which means that if I input 190 in Z rotation and I key that, it might become minus 170 instead. So I'm just going to go ahead and select these keys and just pull them down one, one revolution. And now when we scrub this and play it, we have something that looks a bit better. Very nice. Okay, so now we have our virtual camera move. The fastest way we can test this and play it back without actually needing to do any blueprinting is going to simply be to take our level sequence. We are going to drag and drop it into our level, like so. And in the details tab for this level sequence, we are simply going to enable autoplay. We can now test this by going to preview. We can see that the moment I hit the button, we are now playing our virtual camera move. But we will also see that it is not going to snap back to the tracked camera. The reason for that is we haven't actually made any blend logic yet, which means that the moment this level sequence starts playing, we are simply going to be hijacked or tracked camera is getting hijacked by this camera cut path and we never cleanly move back to the right camera. Instead of cutting to a virtual camera, it, it tends to look a lot nicer if you do a blend. By a blend, I mean that we have a tracked camera, we have a virtual camera somewhere close to the tracking ca track camera, and then what we do is over time, our view is going to blend from one to the other. So we sort of make a in-between camera which has a blend of the parameters of the tracked and the virtual camera, and we just slowly glide from one to the other while we are already playing our virtual camera move. We don't do the blend before we start the virtual camera move because then we're going to have sort of a nasty start, stop, start movement, which looks a bit jerky and not very pleasing to the eye. So the first thing we need to do is then delete this camera cut track. We will save our level sequence. And we will need to start making a blueprint to handle this blend action. So we're going to go ahead and right click and simply create a new blueprint. We are going to call this BP underscore virtual move handler. And we are going to make this blueprint in a way that will allow us to, once we have made it, use it for any virtual camera move we are ever going to use in the future as long as they are fairly straightforward and doesn't have any weird shenanigans happening to them. 
But this is again going to be showcasing how to create a template that we can modify with simply replacing parameters instead of having to make a new blueprint for every single virtual camera move we're ever going to do. So I'm opening my blueprint. We are going to go to the event graph. We are not going to need to put anything inside the blueprint itself because all the level sequences we will be using or our animations, as well as all the virtual cameras we're going to be accessing are all going to be variables. So that means we're going to need two variables just to get started. We are going to need our virtual camera and we are going to need the animation for the virtual camera, which is going to be a level sequence. Let's go ahead and add those right now. First, we are going to have our virtual move. The virtual move is going to be a level sequence, specifically a level sequence actor. The difference between these is that this is a sort of a generic reference to a level sequence in your content browser, whereas this, a level sequence actor reference, is a reference to a specific level sequence typically within your level. We're going to compile it, save it, and we're going to ensure that we hit this little eyeball to, to make this a public variable. When, what this does when we click this little eyeball here and we put our virtual move handler within our scene, we can see now that in the details tab for this new blueprint, we have a We do not actually have any, but let's see why did that happen? Did I compile this? I did not compile it, that's why. So now that we've compiled our blueprint, we can see that under default here, we now have a new input for virtual camera moves. I can even go ahead and click that and assign the virtual move we just made. The next thing we have to do is add a virtual camera reference. Let's call this virtual camera. And this is going to be a virtual camera reference instead. We're also gonna go ahead and make this a public variable. So now we have our virtual move and our virtual camera. I'm also going to go ahead and just assign that on this blueprint right away so I don't forget. There we go. Now let's start making some logic. Uh, this is a good showcase of how we integrate our Pixitop specific logic within Unreal. We try to stay within the framework of Unreal as far as humanly possible, which is also going to be visible here. So for this virtual entry move, we are going to need two actions. We want, first we need a button to allow us to just jump to the start frame. Since this is going to be an entry move, we need to be able to pause and hold at the first frame of the animation. And then we need a second button to allow us to trigger animation and do the actual fly-in. The reason we need to pause at the start is we need to have a freeze frame we can hold until the technical director cuts to the virtual camera, for instance. So let's go ahead and make these custom events right now. We are going to have PX um, pause at start. And then we are going to have PX resume play. So for this uh, PX pause at start, the first thing we're going to do is blend to our virtual camera. I'm simply going to get a reference to the virtual camera. In order to blend to a virtual camera, there's a lot that has to happen under the hood. We need to blend our lens settings. We need to blend the pulse process settings on the two different cameras. We are going to need the, to blend the transforms, the location, rotation, and scale of the different cameras. There's a lot of stuff happening. Luckily, we've black boxed all of that within a single, very user-friendly node, which is being handled by what we call the Pixelop coordinator. The Pixelop coordinator is a utility or a function that simply deals with all our advanced camera logic. I'm going to get the reference to the Pixelop coordinator. And the pixel coordinator is going to deal with switching to a new camera. We can see here we have a few options. We can choose to switch to a camera, which is generally means switching to a virtual camera. We can switch from a virtual camera to another virtual camera, or we can switch from a tracked camera to a virtual camera. We also have the option to switch back to a tracked camera, which we're going to be using when we are done with the virtual move and wish to blend back to a tracked camera. 
So we're going to start by switching to a camera. Since we just want to pause at start, we don't need to deal with any blend time. I'm just going to leave that at zero. Uh, we are not going to be using the lens data from the tracked camera. We are going to be, we, because we might want to animate the depth of field and the field of view on the virtual camera move. So we're going to turn that off. We don't really need to set the blend function, which is like an easing curve, simply because we are not going to have a blend time to begin with. The last thing we need to do is connect a virtual camera to this camera input field, but we can see that we don't have that luxury. The reason for this is something that is pretty consistent within Unreal. It's good to be aware of. Similar to many other 3D solutions, most of the actors that reside within the world outliner are kind of uh, containers. A lot of the logic that we need to access, uh, a lot of the interesting things in an actor is a component living inside, inside the actor itself. For instance, this bust over here, or the statue over here by the window, let's see here, this one. This is a static mesh actor. If I click it, we can see that I have here the static mesh actor itself, but the actual geometry lives within a component inside this actor, which is this static mesh component underneath. If I were to say, replace this, that, that is going to replace the geometry itself. If inversely, if I am to select this tracked camera, for instance, we can see that again, the tracked camera itself is just a container which has a transform, but all the interesting things like the scene camera component, which regulates the film back, the lens settings, yada, yada, as well as some other components used to handle how this camera moves are all components which are children, well, contained within the tracked camera actor. Think of actors as frequently being sort of cardboard boxes with all the stuff you need inside them. So in the blueprint, you will often have to open your boxes up and grab a reference to whatever is inside them, which is exactly what we're going to be doing now to access the SYN camera component within a virtual camera actor. So here, I'm going to go ahead and pull out from the virtual camera. And we're going to get the scene camera component within this virtual camera. And this is the actual camera logic we can connect to our switch to camera logic. Let's get this garbage out of here. Let's go ahead and select our pause at start node and enable call an editor. So we get this handy little gear allowing us to trigger this directly from the editor interface. Let's go ahead and hit play. Now we can see we are looking to attract camera, but if I now am to trigger um, a pause at start, you can see that we blend to our virtual camera. This might actually need to be a non-zero value. I'm not sure, so I'm just going to set this to 0 0.02. The next thing we need to do after we switch to our camera is we also need to start our level sequence and pause it immediately. So I'm going to go ahead and pull in our virtual camera move. We are going to play it. We are not going to be playing it for long. Um, there's cleaner ways of doing this, but just to keep it easily understandable, we are, we are just going to open it and let it play for a fraction of a second. Then we are going to do a pause or a delay by, let's say, 0 0.01 seconds. And then we are going to pause the level sequence. The reason I add this little delay is just to ensure that we are able to pause after the play has begun. Otherwise, there's a chance that the pause logic might trigger before the level sequence has opened and finished starting playing, which means that it will not pause correctly. So let's comment our logic so we understand what's happening here. This segment at the start, we fire off the action, we blend to the virtual camera with no blend time. And this opens and pauses the virtual camera move at more or less the very first frame. 
let's now verify this logic by hitting play and triggering it. So again, we hit play. We start by looking at the track camera, triggering our virtual camera move handler, immediately snaps us to our virtual camera move. We can, however, see that I actually assigned the wrong camera. For some reason, we actually have what appears to be a sim camera actor in the scene for some reason. Okay, so we actually had two virtual cameras here. One is a, a st um, standard real type. I'm going to go ahead and delete that. I'm also going to go ahead and delete the old level sequence here. We're also going to go ahead and delete everything that it was depending on. There we go. Sorry about that. It was just a bunch of old residual things, which was throwing me off for a loop because the actual virtual camera we're supposed to be blending to is this one over here. So now we've assured that we assigned the correct virtual camera. Let's try our logic one more time. We hit play, we select the virtual move handler, we pause at start. Now this does seem a bit sus suspect because we are not supposed to be snapping to the center here, but let's just move on and see what happens. Interesting. Let's go ahead and enable copy center to attract. Let's set the blend time to be a bit longer and see if this gives us behavior more in line with what we are expecting. Hit play. We blend to our virtual camera. Our virtual camera is not at the expected position. So let's try to play the level sequence and see what's actually going on here. So now we're going to add the logic to actually start the playback of our virtual camera move. We're going to drag in a reference to our virtual move here. When we hit this button, we are going to simply resume playing our sequence. Compile and save. We hit preview, set the version move handler. We can see that we are missing a secondary button because I forgot to expose the new event as something we can add call in editor. So I open the blueprint again, we will enable call in editor, compile and save, and fire this off. Preview live, set the version move handler, pause at start, and then resume playback of our level sequence. I know what's happening here. Something that's interesting is that we can see that we're always snapping to a new position. Every time we trigger this blend, we are at some arbitrary position in our level sequence. The reason for that is the level sequence, which is still in our level. We never actually turned off autoplay, which means that the level sequence starts playing immediately. So the virtual camera move starts playing before I ever actually hit the button. If I turn this autoplay off, and now we hit play, and now we select our blueprint again. Now that we, when we hit pause at start, we can see we are finally glued up against the fireball, which is where we wish to start off. And now we can finally start playback for level sequence, and we can see the full move just as we expect to see it. The last thing we have to do to finish this off is at the end of the move, we need to blend back to our tracked camera. This logic is going to be very similar to what we already did. Let's also go ahead and prettify our scene a little bit. As you can see that having all these gorgeous baked details, it's a bit of a shame not having nicer looking blooms. Let me go ahead and dive into a director, go to composite and just 
pump up some, no, sorry, go to effects and pump up some details here. There we go. Well, that's a bit of a shame not really having any heat in here. But this uh, is me just being driven off on a tangent, so let's get back on track. So we were going to end our version move by blending back to our track camera. So let's go back into our blueprint. So now we're actually going to do a little bit of maths. In case any of you are wondering why we're doing all this blueprint logic, by the way, it's because there are a lot of utilities, widgets, and pre fabricated pieces of blueprint logic you can acquire in different places, for instance, through the Unreal Marketplace. But if you wish to have any kind of complete, if you wish to have complete control over what's happening in your graphics, if you wish to be able to build custom elements and do visual effects that people haven't seen before, you need to be able to program them. Again, it's a very simple user-friendly interface. It's a delight to work in. So you shouldn't be afraid of diving in and learning blueprints. I would, we simply consider it essential if you're going to start building interactive graphics. So what we need to do now is we need to blend back from our virtual camera to our tracked camera. We need to do this, of course, towards the end of the virtual move when we are approaching our final destination. The problem is we are making this utility to be recyclable, which means that we don't know, first of all, we don't know how long the virtual sequence is going to be. We don't even necessarily know which virtual sequence or virtual camera move we are going to be using. Because this same blueprint might be used for three different virtual camera moves, which might be 10 seconds long, five seconds long, and 30 seconds long. We also don't know how long we wish to blend across. We don't know like the timing. Maybe we in some blueprints, we want to have a slow blend over several seconds. In another blueprint, we want to have a punchy blend over half a second just to aggressively snap back to our track camera. This means more variables. We're going to go ahead and add two more variables. These are going to be blend in. It's going to be a float in case we want to have fractions of a second. You could also make this an integer if you instead wish to have logic where you base your blend timings on frames instead of seconds. But I'm a huge fan of seconds because they are frame rate agnostic. Blend in and blend out. These are both going to be public variables. And we can now go ahead and quickly build our logic. So what we're going to be doing here, we're going to play our level sequence. And then at some point, we are going to again use our coordinator pixel top coordinator there we go from this we are going to switch to our tracked camera and we are going to do this over the span of our blend out time we're going to go ahead and just set the default value of that to two seconds as well as blend in which means that if a user doesn't manually input a value in the blueprint or in the instance then we're just going to default to two seconds we are going to go ahead and make this a nice Bezier ease in, ease out. Instead of having a sort of a sharp linear blend, we're going to have a nice fall off on the start and finish, just to try to hide the fact that we're actually doing a blend in the first place. And then we're going to connect this. The problem here is that now this logic is going to fire immediately. We will never actually see the virtual camera move itself. So we need a delay. That delay is going to be for the duration of the entire level sequence minus the time we need to do our final camera blend. So let's go ahead and do that exact thing. We're going to add a delay. The duration of the delay is going to be the length of the virtual move or level sequence. So we, of course, we need to get the duration. Uh, we can get that as a frame duration, we, or we can just get it as a time struct. I'm going to go ahead and get us a time struct. 
I don't think I can do that in seconds. No, I cannot do it in seconds. This gives me a structure which has hours, minutes, seconds, and, and frames. I'm just going to go ahead and pull out from that and convert that complex structure into something more readable. I'm just going to get seconds. So now these two nodes are going to give us the remaining time of the level sequence. Uh, then we're going to subtract this time because we need to wait for this duration minus the blend out time. So if this level sequence is 10 seconds and the blend out time is two seconds, this means that we're going to wait for 10 minus two, eight seconds before we blend over the last remaining two seconds. I'm also just going to add, because I'm paranoid, I will add another little subtraction here, just to give it a little bit of a buffer in case something happens. Just So we're basically going to slice off even more time at the end to ensure we have time to safely finish our blend. Let's say we just add another 20th of a second, and this is going to go into our delay node. Now let's give this a spin and see what happens. We're actually not going to look at the viewport for now. We are simply going to look at our logic. What we're going to expect now that we hit play is when I click the first button, PX pulse at start, we are going to see the top logic fire off and it's going to pause at the start. When I hit the next button, we are going to see this white line glow orange to the delay node, where it's going to hold for several seconds until we see the blend happen. You can see the pause, four seconds left, the virtual move is playing, and at the end, it's finally going to kick off and blend back to attract the camera. This looks all well and dandy. Let's take a look at how this looks in our actual viewport. Let's go ahead and hit preview live. You can see my output looks a bit red. Let's go ahead and just color tint that a little bit. Good enough. And let's go ahead and fire off our virtual move. In case some of you are wondering why the output looks slightly different from the viewport, as mentioned the other day, this is because we are using our new linear workflow. But un until we are rolling out 1.3, you don't actually see the final correct conversion, the color space conversion happening in the viewport. Okay, so we pause at start, which blends the track camera and locks it. We trigger our virtual camera move. You can see it playing. We do our virtual camera move. And towards the end, over the last two seconds, we blend back to our tracked camera. Amazing. And now if I wish to change some of this logic, let's say I want to blend much more aggressively, I can set this to 0.5 without having to go back into the blueprint. Uh, there's one last thing we have to do. Uh, because this logic so far only supports virtual camera moves with no blend in time. But what happens if I just want to push a single button to do everything? A single button that blends into the virtual camera, fires the virtual move, and blends out at the end. Well, in that case, I will just need to add some logic before this play node here. We're going to have one last uh, custom event. This is going to be if, if you just want to trigger sort of a standard virtual move, PX uh, transition. Well, I'll just call this actually a PX play. No need to keep it overly complicated. Let's go ahead and call it an editor. And here, all we're going to do is copy paste this switch to camera logic. We are going to switch to the same camera, but instead of having a insignificantly small blend time, we are actually going to be using our blend in logic. Those are our blend in variable, two seconds by default. And then 
the, as the blend is happening, we're just going to dive into this play logic and this, yeah, this play logic as we were already using it. So now we've actually, in a very short amount of time, built a nifty little blueprint that we then can go ahead and use forever. So this is standard play. This is our blend to virtual camera with no blend time into a pause. And this is going to be our playback logic. It's always nice to comment your blueprints just so the people that come after you can easily identify what your logic is supposed to be doing. All right. So now we've set up a logic allowing us to blend to this time position. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to use the same blueprint allowing us to jump to a new talent position. So let's go ahead and do that now. The problem we have within this set is that it's um, it's a long corridor. There's not really a lot of other interesting talent positions to choose from. So we're just going to go ahead and add a new wing to this Baroque hallway. I'm just going to do some quick modeling here. Let's just hide the sky sphere. We don't hide it, not delete it. Let's just select the uh, this end, let's see, up to this, I guess. That seems fine. We are just going to take this entire section. We are going to copy it over. We're going to give it a nice 90 degree rotation. There we go. And we are just going to intersect that into our hallway, just so we can turn a bend. The reason for this is that when we do this virtual move between two different positions, we don't want to be seeing our start position and our end position at the same time. The reason is we need to teleport our talent while our virtual camera is still moving so that as we leave the talent behind and arrive at our new position, the talent is already going to be there patiently waiting for us. Just going to go ahead and quickly slide these elements into a way that works. There we go, select all these segments. And we're just going to go ahead and move this over. It doesn't really have to be pretty, it just needs to not look glaringly wrong or flickering like this floor. There we go. Then I'm just going to go ahead and kick in this wall fixture. And here we now have a new hidden little antechamber in our hallway. Okay. I'm also going to take this and simply copy paste it and move it up just to fill in this ceiling segment. Let's go ahead and do that with this wall fixture as well. There we go. If we had more time, I would go ahead and add some god rays and make this look a bit pretty, but this will simply have to suffice for now. Let's add a spotlight or two for the talent position, and then we're going to move on with the rest of our logic. We don't actually have any spotlight geometry in here. I probably should be using point lights instead for all these different chandeliers. It's never a good idea to have lights which don't have any actual logical light emitter. We're just going to go ahead and do this for now.
It's not pretty, but it will have to do. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to make a new virtual camera move. Um, so that we're going to go ahead and make a new level sequence. LS virtual move, oh sorry, LS virtual move uh, transition. And we're going to go ahead and add a virtual camera and animate it. Strictly speaking, since we're not going to be playing both virtual moves at the same time, there's no reason why I couldn't just go ahead and animate the pre-existing virtual camera. But just because I like to keep things segmented, I'm going to go ahead and add a new virtual camera. I will simply add it here to my scene. I'm going to match it up as close as I can to the position of the actual tracked camera. The closer the virtual camera is to the position of the tracked camera, the less significant the transition is going to be, or the blend from track to virtual. It just has to be in the ballpark, especially since we don't we will never know exactly where the tracked camera is going to be as it's going to be moving during our production. But this is good enough. Let's go I'll call this V virtual camera transition. Let's go ahead and add this new camera to our level sequence. And again, the logic is going to be the same. I'm simply going to delete the camera cut. I'm going to right click and pilot my camera. I'm going to select the transform tab. And I'm just going to add a few keys using enter. At the halfway point is more or less when we are going to be doing our actual virtual move. No, sorry, when we are going to be moving our actual talent position. So when we round this corner, our talent is already going to be waiting for us on the far end of this hallway. Let's take a look at this virtual move. It's pretty good. Let's go ahead and scrub this out down a bit. Let's also fix this rather annoying 360 by going to rotation curve editor and just offset this start curve. So this start point. There we go. We play, if we go around the corner, we fly in here. Okay. I'm also going to go ahead and offset this a little bit because the second part was a bit slow, the first part was a bit fast. Just trying to get a nice smooth movement going. This is a bit slow, this is a bit fast. So let's go ahead and take these two and make this a bit punchier. A bit much. Let's also go ahead and slow down the first part by a tiny tad. Oh, no, 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 no. And let's set the end point to be matching the last frame of our actual animation. Now we are going to go ahead and add a new BP virtual move handler. Let me just decouple from this camera. We don't need to pilot this anymore. I'm just going to eject. We are going to go ahead and add a new virtual camera move handler over here. I'm just going to rename it. This is one that's going to deal with our transition. And this first one simply deals with our entry. So for, so for this one, notice now that we added a new virtual move, but we don't have to change any blueprint logic. We just have to assign the virtual move, I have to put it on the level. We have to assign the virtual camera and we have to set a blend time. Maybe I'll have a slightly punchier blend on this one. And now we can go ahead and hit play and we can test the logic right away. So I'm not going to do entry. I'm just going to go directly to transition. I'm going to hit PX play. So we blend to our camera, we zoom around and then we blend back to the tracked camera. 
The reason we go back to the start position is because the last thing we're missing is logic to move the actual camera root. There's many ways we could go about doing this. We could, for instance, simply open the same level sequence, grab our camera root, and pull the camera root into our level sequence like this, and simply animate it the same way we're animating anything else. So here I'll wait until my camera has moved far past the actual mannequin. So the talent is not in frame, but we still don't see the new position yet. I'm going to add a transform. And on the very next frame, I'm going to go ahead and move our camera root to the new talent position. Which is going to be over here at the far end of our hallway. Uh, this, this way. Straighten this up a bit. There we go. We can see that we have a problem here. We can see that we've left our internal composition plane behind, but that is easily fixed by simply taking our internal composition plane, which you see here. We can right click it in the content browser. We can go ahead and parent, attach it or parent it to the camera root. So now when we animate the camera root, we will also be animating the internal composition plane. Let's try this one more time. Do it play. We play our transition logic. Sorry, that's not going to be this one. It's going to be version move transition. And as you can see, as we play our version move, we can see our talent is waiting for us here. But the moment we exit, we pop back to a start position. Why did this happen? Let's try this one more time. Play our virtual move. Our talent is waiting for us. And at the end, we teleport back to the start position. How inconvenient. This has to do with a very important concept within level sequences, which deals with keep states or handling the states of actors. By default, everything you will animate in a level sequence when the level sequence completes, the level sequence is going to close and everything you animated will revert back to where it was before the level sequence started playing in the first place. Which means that at the end of this animation, it's going to close the level sequence and the camera root snaps back here. There's a lot of reasons why this is usually intended and good behavior. It ensures that we always have control over where our actors are. We won't have residual transforms and parameters being left in the scene from level sequences that we've been playing uncontrollably. But sometimes we wish to keep the state of what the level sequence animated. To forcefully preserve that, you could either go to edit project settings and make it the default in your project, or you can right click the specific track, in this case, the transform track for the camera root, go to properties, and we can set that when this level sequence is finished, we are going to keep the new state of the camera root. We save this, we close it, we play it again. And now, as we finally can see, when we do our play, we fly through our scene, and we are left at our new talent position. Excellent. So this is more or less virtual camera moves in a nutshell. There's other things you can do with this as well. You can do all kinds of crazy things like attach your virtual camera to your tracked camera and then simply off pull it out along the z-axis, which will in effect let you, if you have, for instance, a jib, you can extend the jib arm in virtual with as much as you like. If your actual arm is, say, 10 meters, you can now suddenly have a 100 meter long jib in virtual. And you can also do all kinds of jumping between different virtual cameras. You can do virtual pans. You can do whatever you like. They're very easy to use and very easy to let you get around in your scene, even if you just have a very small green screen and no option for the talent to walk around on the green screen itself which means that having a small green screen by itself doesn't really have to limit what you can do with your virtual production. 
uh, which more or less summarizes this sheet. We're now going to be doing more of a deep dive into blueprints as well as connecting our blueprints to a control panel. Um, so the thing we're going to be looking at right now is going to be bars or graph elements. Once we've cloned out over into this hallway, we would like to take a look at a graph, a graph, and we would like to populate it with parameters directly through our control panel. Let's just search for graph. I believe we have a mockup already in our scene here. There we go. This is just a little simple showcase of a graphic graph element. Now, before we start using this, let's consider why we would want to use a blueprint for a graph instead of a level sequence. The biggest thing is if I were to do this with a level sequence and I animate all these different bars to go up and down to give me a graph, if I ever wish to change the logic or basically the graph itself, I would have to go into level sequence and hand animate all the different bars, which simply is not a scalable solution. It's also not fast enough. An operator needs to be able to sit in the control panel and populate the graph within seconds and push it to the live broadcast. So this blueprint, we're going to open it. Uh, this is not really the cleanest way of doing this. I'm so certain we have some programmers in our viewship who are wringing their hands asking why we are not reusing code, but it's still copy pasting instead of copy pasting. But this is just so we quickly could have a easily readable example to work with. What we have here is the same logic copied four times with hard-coded values for each and every bar. In the viewport, we can see that we have the different elements of the graphic. And we can see that these geometries here are the actual bar elements. That's static mesh component one through seven. In the event graph, we can see that we are doing something on component one through seven. So you can see there's the seven bars are here up as their own little clusters. Uh, so what's happening here is that when we fire an event, we kick off a timeline. The timeline is simply a timeline within a blueprint. We generally tend to use timelines that go from zero to one over an arbitrary amount of time, just because then we don't really care about what the particular values are. We're just going to blend between zero or one or A and B, where A is our start variable and B is our end variable. So basically we use the output of this timeline, which is this new track, to drive a linear interpolation or a blend. And then you can see the same value is then being used for all the different bar elements. We get the scale of the respective bar. We break out the Z value or the height, and we simply blend between the start position of this bar, and we move towards this new hard-coded variable. And then we set the world scale, as you see here. This is being done on all seven bars, every single tick, as long as this timeline is running. There's actually a little error here. You should also be doing this on the last tick, but that's not really the end of the world. So let's go ahead and play with this graph and see it in action. Let's go ahead and hit simulate. Let's uh, find our graph. which doesn't seem to have a details panel for some reason. Interesting. Interesting and bizarre. There we go. I just had to reselect it. Okay. So here we can see we've exposed these four presets. And as you can see, we're able to trigger this graph. But again, all of these values are hard coded. Let's see how we could go about instead interacting with this from our control panel. We're going to set the logic and then we're going to connect all the different pieces for our production. The intro move, the transition move, the graph, as well as the 3D text element. 
in order to wrap up this blueprint section. Let's also go ahead and add the 3D text element at the top. It's a bit hard to read with this sort of gray dull material. So let's go ahead and give it some materials to make it stand out a bit. The white itself doesn't really make it punchy enough. So I'm going to go ahead and quickly throw together a new material from scratch. Let's just go ahead and make it the material. Um, text white. Let's go ahead and give this a nice white color. Let's go ahead and also give it a bit of roughness. And let's going to let's go ahead and also add a little bit of glow in order for this to be readable. Um, I'm getting a note here on the side. We've received some reports about poor performance on our screen share. Sadly, this is a bit outside of our control due to the oral congestion of the internet these days. But please rest assured that you will have the recording of this session made available to you at some point after this broadcast. So you can review things at your own pace if there's some things that you missed, sadly, due to compression. Okay, I'm also going to make this slightly emissive. So even if the environment is very dark, you can still read it. And let's apply this to our text. There we go, that's a lot more readable. Let's also give it a nice black frame. Uh, white text with the black border is readable against pretty much any background. But we can see we don't really have a border. So I'm just going to go ahead and select the 3D text element and go down to bevel to give it a bit of a nice bevel to make it more readable. There we go. Let's also give it a bit more thickness, a bit more girth. There we go. We actually have a bit too much bloom, so I'm just going to jump into my director interface and pull down the bloom a bit. There is actually such a thing as too much of a good thing. There we go. And there we have our text element. We could, of course, also give it a backdrop, but let's just move on with the logic. So I'm going to go ahead and select our bar graph, and we need to be able to feed values to this using our control panel interface. There's many ways of doing this. I'm actually going to hijack this lowest event. And this is now going to be PX um, execute graph. So there's going to be two actions. First, the operator is going to need to fill in the numeric values for the different elements. And then we are going to click a separate button to execute all of these new values at the same time. In order to do that, we need a way to input values here. Uh, there's many ways you could go about doing that, but for now, let's do it in the most labor intensive, but also most easily understandable way by making a new variable for each separate bar. So I'm just going to go ahead and make a bar variable. It's going to be an, a float because we might want to use decimal values. This one does not necessarily need to be public because we can access non-public non variables from our control panel interface. And now I'm just going to hit Control W to dupli duplicate this a few times. There we go. Now we have bar one through seven. And then, as you probably figured, we have a bit of manual labor ahead of us. We're just going to, instead of using these hard-coded destination values for our blend two states, we're just going to hook in this variable instead. If we have time and if there's interest for this at the end, we might spend a bit of time looking at a much cleaner way of making a blueprint, which might, which is going to use arrays and other automation tools to ensure we don't have to have so much copy paste logic. But let's see if we find the time for that as we, so far this week, I've tended to run a bit over the clock. We're, so, we're very glad to see that so many of you have always stick with us to the end of the sessions, despite them being a bit long, but we do also try to respect your schedules. 
Okay, so now we connect to our logic here, compile and save. Uh, I could go ahead and set the default values for all of them, but by default, it's just going to be zero. Now let's go ahead and jump into our control panel and start building our, well, control panel. We are going to bring up the director. We are going to go ahead and create a new control panel called Versailles Control Panel. Very unfortunate acronym. And then we are going to go ahead and open this control panel. We should reside probably somewhere here uh, at some point. Let's give it a second. There we go. Now let's go ahead and open the control panel. There you go. At the bottom, we open the panel. And here we have our new clean slate. Now let's go ahead and build a control panel and populate it with widgets. So we, if you remember, we have two virtual camera moves. One virtual camera move needs two buttons. Let's go ahead and get organized. Let's put the camera moves over here on the side. At the top, we're going to have the virtual camera move in sort of the intro segment. B, oh, let's shuffle this out a bit. There we go. Uh, below, we're going to have the transition, which is a separate virtual move. And then for the graph itself, we I know we added um, seven bars, but we don't have to populate all of them just to get this idea across. Um, so let's go ahead and just do four. We're going to add four numeric input fields where we can type in numbers. Let's give it a label so we know what this interface does for the operator. Let's also have um, a text field for the 3D text to describe what the graph is showing us, as well as a trigger to finally populate a graph with values. Let's get this organized. Uh, I'm going to lay this out in the same way that the graph is organized in the world, so it's more easily understandable. The text is on top, so I'll put the text up top here. Uh, let's see. We're going to have our label. And then we are going to have our actual execution button. Probably should have a label for the text as well, but this is fine. And then we just start populating our control panel. So then we have intro virtual move. We have transition virtual move. We're going to right click this and add it. This is going to be graph values. Below, we are simply going to have an execution button. So this button, let's make this nice and red because it's going to pause at the start of our virtual move. Uh, pause at start. The target for this is going to be blueprint, the BP virtual move entry. And the function is going to be exotope pause at the start. Next button is going to be play. Let's make it nice and spring green. The target for this is going to be, again, it's going to be a blueprint. It's going to be BP virtual move transition. And this one is just going to, no, sorry, it's not. This, we still got the first one. This is going to be BP virtual move entry. It's going to be resume play. Sorry about that. Getting a bit ahead of myself because this button is going to be the transition. This is just going to be play. Let's also make this nice and spring green. And the target for this is going to be blueprint, virtual move, transition. And the function is going to be px play. Uh, could we possibly change our output so we can just see this in action? So now we're going to have on the side feed, we'll be able to see the SD output so we can see the control panel at the same time. So the operator will just be clicking his buttons, pause at the start. We can then go ahead and play. 
And at the end of our move, we can spend some time with our talent looking down this gorgeous barrack hallway until we do our transition to the new position. The FOV of that move is a bit nasty, so we might want to deal with that. But for now, let's go ahead and connect our logic over here. Okay. So what I just did is I hit this drop down next to the play button and went to simulate because simulate is still a way of playing and simulating a world, allowing me to interact with blueprints, but it doesn't hijack my camera. So I can actually stay here and keep looking at this. For this T3D text, I'm just going to anim activate animation as well. So we don't just get hard cuts as we blend it. I'm going to go ahead and go to transition. We're going to use an animation. Scale from to zero will animate each glyph to zero and then animate the new one up. I'm actually going to use wave, which is the most outrageous default animation we have, which is why I love using it in demo situations. And we're going to set the transition time to be a bit punchy, 0.5. You can also set an idle animation where it just rotates forever. Uh, there are situations where you might want to use this. This is not one of them. So let's go ahead and kill that. Uh, we might easily imagine that instead of having this sort of being dead on behind the talent, we might actually have this being slightly slanted and to the side of our talent position. In which case we might want to add a per glyph of rotation to our text element by going here to add the transform and adding a bit of a added glyph rotation value. I don't think it's going to be this one. Uh, definitely not. Let's give it minus five just to break it up a bit. I don't think it's going to be this one. Mm, no, that's not quite what I was looking for. Third time's the charm. There we go. So here I could very slightly rotate each glyph towards the camera, just to ensure it's more readable from this camera angle, or less readable from this camera angle. Now, all I have to do is edit this text widget. We can here set the character limit for the widget. I'm going to set it to 255. And we're going to go ahead and point this at our text, animated text actor. Let's see here. Apply and save it. This might not actually work, come to think of it. No, because I can't access the panel. Okay, sorry about that. We might actually need to do this using a blueprint instead. Yes, of course. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. We need to do this using a blueprint. So let's uh, dive into our dev folder and create a little blueprint for our 3D text as well, which is going to be recyclable the same way our virtual camera movie blueprint is recyclable. Let's go ahead and call this um, BP text handler. We're not going to make a big show a big deal out of this. We're not going to have logic for text font. We're not going to build logic to adjust the kerning and the letter spacing to ensure that it stays within a certain thickness or length or width, so to speak. We're not going to add logic to replace fonts on the fly, but all of this is possible with our 3D text plugin. For now, we're just going to keep this as simple as possible. We are just going to add a custom event, px set text. And this is going to be a bit different because now we are going to add an input because we are going to pass a data string from the control panel. So let's go ahead and select the string variable type. This is going to be the actual phrase we are going to populate our text element with. And then we need a public variable so we can assign the actual text element that we wish to interact with. Let's go ahead and do that now. Text geo. The variable type is going to be an animated text mesh. There we go. And this is going to be a public variable so I can assign it in the level. We talked earlier about how many actors are containers where we need to mess with things within them, and this is no, this is no exception to that. 
we need to get the parameters for this text geometry. There we go. And then we need to set the members within this target. We can see here that here from this utility, we can choose what we need to set. I can easily expose anything from the font to the phrase to the dynamic polygon density or triangulation density of the widget. I can set the bevel size using floats. I can do whatever I like. For now, we're just going to go ahead and set the phrase. Let's plug this over in here and we can connect this up. Some of you have probably seen this um, 3D text utility in use already, as this was used extensively during this year's Super Bowl during the all time Hall of Fame AR segment, where all the players within that segment had their names showcased using our 3D text plugin. Okay, so now this is all connected and good to go. Now we can start connecting variables. Some of you might have noticed that we actually didn't make these custom events with input parameters for these bar floats for the bar itself. And we are going to see why in a second. Let's first go ahead and edit our 3D text. Let's go ahead and point this at our BP. Uh, did I ever put that in level? You know what, I probably didn't, did I? I made the blueprint, but we never actually put it in a level. Let's get it in here. So what I just did, did I drag and drop our 3D text, our text, text handler into the level. There we go. And I also need to populate the variable for the text geometry. So this blueprint knows that it needs to interact with this 3D text. Luckily, there's only a single 3D text in the scene. So it's very simple to know which one I need to interact with. Let's simulate. Let's uh, reread the scene. And now we can see we have the new text handler blueprint in the drop down list. So I can select it and simply select the new PX text um, custom event. We can also see that this now has an argument, which we don't see on most of the other ones. We can see that we can actually pass a string, which makes sense when we're trying to set the text element. Let's say, let's set this as, a, let's now, let's say that this is going to be a graph for a city, showing some kind of data. Let's input, uh, there we go. We put in the city name. Notice that nothing changes because first you populate this widget. When you're happy with your data, you simply hit confirm to pass your data on to Pixelope. We can see we have a bad symbol here at the end because I have a line break, which are, 3 text utility doesn't recognize out of the box, which means we simply have to get rid of that and try this again. Very nice. We could also go ahead and instead of using a text input field, we could instead make a drop down where we just have predefined values. So I could add a drop down here at the side in case we want to use this instead. We're going to edit this drop down. We are going to make this also access the 3D text, the text handler. This is still going to reference the same function. But now instead of typing the text, we're just going to add a few predefined values. Uh, this can have a display name to say, to describe what the value is. Um, can add another item. The value could be, for instance, Atlanta. Is that going to be capital or capital? Do Excuse my horrendous 
vocabulary, but I'm just going to take a wild guess. So now we can see that I can now choose from this drop down instead. So I don't constantly have to type things. The last thing we need to do is connect our, our bar elements down here. So we can see we have a red border because around these widgets because we haven't given them a function yet. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's edit the first one. We are now going to be pointing at our graph blueprint. We are going to be pointing at bar one, two, four. Notice that these are not functions. These are actually straight up variables because again, since we are fully embedded within a real, we can change variables on the fly. Even if they haven't been exposed explicitly, to Pixitope. We are going to be using floats instead of integers. This one is going to be pointing at number two. That was strange. Let's do it one more time. Uh, seems like it got set. Hmm, look at this. Oh, wait, 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 wait. It got set, but we forgot to change the type from integer to float. Next one is going to be value number three, bar number three. The last one is going to be number four. We're not going to do three last ones. We'll leave it with these four values. And the last thing we're going to do is Oh, thank you, Minus. I, at least someone's paying attention. I also forget to set these two floats as well. There we go. And the last thing we need to do is have an execute when we're done pulling in these numbers, we need to actually fire off the logic. Let's put that in big aggressive letters. Let's give it a, there we go. Execute is an aggressive word, which needs an aggressive type. This is still going to be pointing at bar graph, but now we are going to trigger px execute. Select, apply, save. Now we've all been looking at too many negative graphs in these troubling times. So let's use some, let's make a positive graph for once. Let's make sure that we have a clearly good looking trend. We populate our graph with values and we hit execute. And we can see that, well, that something doesn't look quite right. Let's take a look at what just happened here. Uh, that's not one, it's actually gonna be the graph view. This is clearly connect. Wait, maybe these need to be public after all. Maybe, maybe I was incorrect. Let's try this one more time. I'm making these variables public. Interesting. Hmm. I guess I might have misclicked because it all seems to be working at the second go. So there we go. So now we can see we have a nice, good looking trend going and we can easily update these values to feed in a new graph. So you can say this is the graph for Oslo. And then we could go ahead and prepare the graph for Atlanta. We Everything is bigger in the States, so we're going to use more aggressive values. And then when we populate our values, we can just go ahead and click our buttons. Now we can see that we also probably should have made some logic to ensure our graph stays within the height of the graph, maybe dynamically change 
the scale to actually be a percentage of the max height available instead of a flat value. But that is something we could easily do with a little bit more maths. But I'm sure most of you will be able to figure that out as homework. Good heavens. Okay. So now we looked at how to create a lot of blueprints, which is what we do for a lot of productions. We will generate blueprints. We'll have artists working different sub-levels, making the little bits and pieces. And we'll be putting all of this together in a master level where we can finally make a final control panel allowing us to interact with all our logic when we go live. But people work in different ways. It's very hard to say that we're going to have one uniform way of doing things in terms of blueprints because there's a millions of ways of doing the same thing. So something that might quickly become a problem is how do we organize our blueprints? How do we ensure that all the different pieces of logic that we have in our scene can be interacted with in an easy way from a standardized control panel? Well, enter our baseline event system. Let's see here. So again, the problem we early discovered when we started working with Unreal is that we were setting up events and logic for all our different scenes in very inconsistent ways. Different skill levels, different preferences in workflow meant that different artists would make different blueprints. There was no simple way of standardizing hiding or showing elements. There was no standardized way of ensuring that blueprint could be reset to a default state or re-triggered. Some blueprints could maybe be triggered once and didn't have the logic to be retriggable, while other blueprints could be triggered over and over again, but with functionality that didn't quite behave as expected. Uh, the reason would be that we didn't really have a bespoke list of functions that would limit set a rigid framework for how the blueprint should be structured. Uh, this also meant that reusing blueprints and blueprint elements between different projects would be very inconvenient because we would have a different integration in every project we did. Uh, it also, lastly, it also meant that setting up a control panel would be difficult because we would have all these tiny different blueprints scattered around our scenes and we would have to point to all of them from our control panel in order to set up all the different buttons we needed. But, but we wish to instead have a single master blueprint where we could just access all the logic on the fly and find all the events we needed to be able to execute. Uh, we also needed to tap, make templates for things like virtual camera moves because we now learned how to make a virtual camera move, but it's not really ideal to have to build this from scratch every single time. So what we have built is our blueprint, a blueprint-based baseline event system. Uh, this is something that we are still working on cleaning up, but something that's going to be shipping with Pixitope, allowing you to have a kickstart at setting up your logic for your virtual events. It's great for things like concerts or things where you have to run based things on the time code. It is also great for just having a standardized way of making blueprint logic. We have some utilities here for firing events. As you can see here, we have an event trigger. We can trigger things based on time code, which we feed in through the breakout cable on the Azure card. And we can use that freely within Pixadope. We have uh, some logic for triggering virtual camera sequences and so on and so forth. As you can see, all of these, if we pull them in and look at the details tab, uh, let's extend this a bit. You can see that we have variables where we can populate with data so we don't ever have to go into the blueprint itself and change the blueprint. For the virtual camera template, we just assign a camera, we assign a level sequence, we set the blend in and blend out time, same way in the blueprint we just built. But here we also have a bit more logic. For instance, we can choose whether we want to use the lens data from the tracked camera or not in the virtual camera move. We could choose if we always want to reset and play from the beginning of virtual camera move every time we trigger it. And we could choose whether or not we wish to blend out at the end of the virtual camera move. Whereas for the event trigger, 
this deals with triggering things based on events. That's actually not what I want. I want a uh, time code trigger, sorry. There we go. Which deals with triggering things based on time code. This can trigger both custom events as well as level sequences. So you can see here, we have a bunch of debug utilities. We can set things to live or not live, which means that it's either listening to time code or not listening to time code. We can trigger fake time code for debugs and rehearsals. And here we can input the actual time code queue we wish to listen to. Before we dig into how to use this, we're also going to convert all the logic we made to use the Pixel baseline system. Let's talk a bit more about how the system works. What we quickly realized is that in pretty much every production we did, we, there was a few um, actions we always wanted a blueprint to be able to do. Let's take an example like a virtual camera. So you have your virtual camera, which is going to be a roughly 16 by nine element like this. So you might want to be able to say, it might start off screen, then you might wish to be able to animate it in, and then the, when it's done animating in, the screen turns on and there, there's video or a feed being played back on the screen. And when you're done with this virtual monitor, you might want to simply turn off the video feed and animate it back out. This could be back where it came from, or it could be out the other way. Uh, or, so what we can identify here is that we have a few actions we will need to make a blueprint for. We are going to want an action in, an action out, as well as an action on and off, four actions. In is basically playing the action from the start. We animate it in and turn the screen on. And animate out is the opposite. We turn off the screen and animate it back out, either the same way it came from or in a different way. But then we might want to have a separate action where we can just say, just go to the sort of in state immediately. So we skip the animation, we just teleport in the screen and we have it turned on within a single frame. And we can also have an off, which is like a kill switch saying, get rid of the element, don't play the exit, just get it out. Hitting the off element would just move it off screen without the animation. These last two, the on and off, is useful in situations where maybe the in and out animation is very, very long. Uh, let's say you're doing a stage show for something like Eurovision or a esports event where you're just creating set enhancing graphics. So maybe you have a slow buildup where you have plants growing in behind the stage, or maybe you have a particle effect like a Norlands, like um, um, there's different skies, stars coming twinkling in over the span of half an hour or something insane like that. In which case, during rehearsal, if a technical director says, show me the sparkling stars, you can't just hit the in element and tell the director to just hang out to hold on for half an hour. You need to be able to click a button and just immediately jump to the in state. So this is more or less why we have these four, four states. So what we've done here is we built a system where here under E actions, we can see that we have these four actions. The system is flexible, so you can easily go ahead and add more states if you need them for production. Maybe four is not sufficient for you. But by default, we have in, out, on, and off. So these are actions that any blueprint or any event needs to be able to do. The second thing we do have is the elements within our production. Let's get rid of these before we talk about what these actually are. The elements are the things that are triggerable within your project. Uh, these are things like um, virtual moves, uh, virtual monitors, uh, trigger element uh, particle effect A, where we don't specify what we're doing with that element. We could, because for the particle effect, we might want to animate it in, animate it out, turn it on, turn it off, but it's still is a, it's a still single element within a production. So this is where you can simply block out all the elements you're going to have within a particular project. This is great because this means we can, on a very high level, just say these are elements we're going to have before you even started creating your blueprints. We're going to have a few elements. We're going to have our uh, virtual entry. 
we are going to have our virtual transition. We are going to have our virtual text. We are going to have our graphs. Very nice. Uh, now let's take a look at the bits and pieces we need for this to function. So let's start with our level sequence for a virtual move. First of all, we need a single BP master, which is, con oh, we already have one in the scene. Let's just re-add it. I'm not sure why there was already one there. And the BP master is the centerpiece of our baseline system. The purpose of the BP master is to grab hold of all the different elements in our scene. So you don't have to manually hook up things to the BP master. It's simply going to grab everything which is relevant to the baseline system on begin play. We can also do it manually hitting collect event actors, but doing so isn't going to give us any actors because we haven't created any yet. So there we have a BP master. Let's take a look at it. So here we have a lot of logic to deal with things like collecting the actors, collecting the time code sequences, and basically everything required for being able to interact with the bits and pieces of our production. We also have logic to reset all our elements, to reset our level sequences, to pause our, all our level sequences. Basically a bunch of utilities for generic rehearsal and live requirements. We also have logic here to play a fake timecode in case we don't have access to live timecode from audio playback. Great for rehearsals. Then at the top here, this is more or less the only place where you have to build any, where you can build any kind of logic. Underneath pieces of events is where you would add elements or events that you are going to access from your control panel. So if you're going to have 20 different clickable things within a project, you would go ahead and add all of these within Pigstop events in the BP master. So you have all of them in a single place. We can go ahead and do this right now before we even have made our different blueprints. So let's think here, we, which elements do we have? We have our virtual camera move in and play. We have our virtual camera move play here. And then we have some graph logic. So first of all, we're going to need PX intro start. And this is simply going to trigger that particular element within a production. So we drag out and we search for element, element action. And here we simply choose from this enumerator that when we fire off this custom event, PX intro start, this is going to trigger uh, the virtual entry and the action is not going to be in, it is going to be on. So then we will make logic. So this is a bit of an edge case because here we actually have two triggerable actions. It doesn't really make sense to use on to jump to the start position. Luckily, a single piece of logic can have multiple elements. So we could have one element called uh, play intro, another one called set intro, or we could just say that on is going to jump to the start position. And then we could have a second se separate function for px intro play, which now is going to, on the virtual entry, actually play or animate in the level sequence. We can go ahead and keep adding functions like this. We're going to have px transition. This is simply going to fire off the element the element virtual transition and it's just going to trigger in which generally by our convention is going to be the animation segment. We could go ahead and add some for the graphs and such as well, but I don't think we need to rec reconstruct all the logic. We could just go ahead and let's say, um, what else do we need to have? Let's 
let's add one more. Let's add on this last PX, let's add last custom event. And this is simply going to trigger our graph with pre-programmed values. This is going to be PX graph preset one. And this is going to fire element action graphs. Let's actually make two buttons just so we can see how we can also use multiple elements in a single blueprint. So, so we are going, not, not this one, we're going to go to this enumerator. We're going to have graph one and we're going to have graph two. The cool thing is changing the name of these enumerators is automatically refreshed in all the targets. So we can see here, oh, I forgot to actually assign it. But changing the names of an element is not going to break the logics or the connections. So we have graph preset one and we have PX graph preset two. Okay. And number two is going to trigger the element action graph two. And we're just going to bring that one in instead. So the interesting thing here is now we actually built all the different control panel buttons. I could go ahead and connect these up to a control panel right now. Simply by here going to a control panel, I could start editing actions saying this is now going to be pointing at BP master. Um, and here we can see all the different functions we're going to be using or the all the different actions we're going to be using in our in our production within a single list, making the job for the operator who might need to change or build a control panel that much easier. So I can instantly connect this to, for instance, the graph preset, or in this case, probably the intro start. We can just go ahead and select apply and save this. But we haven't actually connect, we haven't actually made these blueprints yet. So. The way now that we, this is kind of the watershed moment. This is why this is so useful. Because now your artists can keep making blueprints the way they're used to, but they will have to connect their respective blueprints in their respective sublevels to our baseline system. Let's go ahead and do this, for instance, for our virtual move entry. The way we connect any blueprint, any standard real blueprint to our system is simply by going opening it, going to file, reparent blueprint, and we're going to reparent it to our event actor. Doing this is going to now allow us to assign the element that this blueprint is supposed to interact with, as well as uh, as well as assign which actions are, go are going to be connected to different blueprint nodes. So this blueprint right here is going to be able to trigger two different ele elements, three different elements. Sorry, two different elements. So here we're going to say that this virtual move handler is going to interact with virtual move entry as well as virtual transition. I can't really make new ones here. They're all be, they have already been pre-created in the enumerator we made earlier. And then we can say that here, instead of using this custom function, we are simply going to use the event action in. Sorry, action on is going to go to the start pose. And action in is going to actually start the playback. So the master blueprint is now going to be able to grab the virtual move handlers because they inherit from the BP event handler, the event actor, which is what the BP master is looking for. So to go trigger on the entry, we know that the element we're going to use is going to be virtual intro. So let's just switch on the element and say that if action on is triggered on virtual entry, we're going to fire this off. And down here, if action in is triggered on virtual entry, 
we are going to play this animation. Lastly, back here, if action in is triggered on Let's uh, let's space this out a bit. So, if action in is triggered on the virtual entry or basically the start transition, we are going to skip ahead to the play logic. But if event action in is triggered on virtual transition, instead we need to go down here to do the transition logic. All right. I can see now that with this logic, we are we're going to need to make this a bit more granular because here we're using the same blueprint for different virtual camera moves. But we could easily build logic where we check or basically say that this particular instance should only listen to, for instance, this particular virtual transition. I could make a public variable where we filter the enumerator for the instance of this blueprint. We're going to go do the same, give the same treatment to our bar graphs over here. Let's go ahead and open this. Let's do the same thing. We're going to reparent this blueprint to our event actor. Let's go ahead and compile and save this. And we are going to go ahead and here. So we have, so if you remember, we made two different elements or two different graph presets. So let's go ahead and you do the same logic now. Event, uh, sorry action in, not action in. We are again, we are going to identify the element that we are trying to trigger using a switch. And if that element is graph one, we are going to use this first preset up here. If the element is graph two, we're going to use the preset down here. We're almost done now. The last thing we need to do is connect all of this to triggerable logic. Let's quickly go ahead and see if we can trigger this from the control panel. So editing Blueprint Master, we see that we already made these two graph preset functions, which trigger graph one and graph two. Let's go ahead and simulate. Let's go ahead and make these two different triggers in our control panel. And let's point these at BP Master. It's going to be graph preset one for the top button. And it's going to be graph preset two for the bottom button. Okay, so before we hit play on this, let's check if our BP master has been able to find the graph. We can see now that there's three event actors that the BP master has grabbed hold of. We can see it has grabbed hold of the virtual move blueprints, and it also has grabbed hold of the bar graph. So now we can test this. We can try to click our new buttons, which now through the BP master is going to trigger these elements, and then the which then is called on every single event actor in the scene, but due to the filtering of the switch we put in all the blueprints, only the graph blueprint is going to interact or react. So here we hit graph one and nothing happens. Interesting. Let's take a look at why that is. So you can see here that clicking this button does not actually fire off this particular bar graph. That's a bit of a shame. Let's try to figure out why. Uh, the reason why is that we never actually told this bar graph that it's supposed to listen to event graph one and graph two. The, re the way that we use these elements is that we assign elements to different blueprints. So we need to tell this that, hey, you're supposed to listen for these two calls, and if they're fired off, that's when you react. So I connect those. 
to access this uh, elements list, all I have to do is select the root component of the blueprint, which gives me access to these element variable fields. And now I hit simulate, graph one, and graph two. Excellent. The last thing we're going to do is now we have this entire production. We're going to trigger all of it based on time code. So let's go ahead and edit this virtual camera move. Uh, I'm not sure if this is going to work. I'm a bit rusty on this, but let's give it a try. So each virtual move handler is always only going to deal with a single virtual move. So instead of using this switch on elements, let's just connect this directly. Uh, let's see, if on is fired, we go to switch to camera. If element action in is triggered and we are in the entry, we're just going to skip ahead here. If it's virtual transition, we're going to go down here. Okay, so now, because we can also override the element that we're supposed to be listening to per instance of the blueprint. Why do I have the graph open? I'm supposed to be working on the virtual move. So here we're just going to go ahead and have a single element accessible for the virtual move handler. The entry virtual move handler is only going to deal with virtual entry. The transition is only going to be de dealing with virtual, trans virtual transition. So now when from BP master, when we call action on and later on in on entry, that's going to be firing off this blueprint. When we call the transition, that's going to be firing off this blueprint. And when we fire off our preset graph, that's going to fire off this blueprint, either graph one or graph two. The last thing we're gonna do is connect all of this to time code. So we're just gonna go ahead and go to our blueprints master folder. And we're going to use a few BP time code triggers. So the way these function is that the moment we start receiving time code using the breakout input slot on the Azure card, if a blueprint is live and we the time code scrubs past the queue point for the blueprint, the blueprint is going to execute. So we can see here that if I set this blueprint to display time code, you can see we are not receiving a time code. We don't have it set up right here in the studio, but if I were to say trigger start mock time code, we can see that the clock starts ticking. I could also go to BP master and I could from the BP master start start mock time code on all elements in the scene, which would start a clock on every single actor we have. So let's go ahead and make a separate time code trigger for all the different elements. So notice that this is completely se separate from the actual blueprints themselves. This could be built the moment we get, for instance, a previs for our production. If we know that certain things are going to trigger at certain time codes, we could go ahead and set up our time code triggers as one of the first things we do in the project. Let's say that we want to start our virtual camera move at 10 seconds. Let's ensure that we are, let's see here. Okay, so. At 10 seconds and let's say five frames, we are going to go ahead and trigger our virtual entry. And we are just going to snap, we are going to play it in. Before we can actually do the in though, we should turn it on, which means we snap to the freeze frame. Let's do that the first thing we do when we hit play, or let's do it after two seconds. And no frames, there we go. Then we're going to play our in animation. That's going to take a few seconds, so let's wait until we've 20 seconds have passed for the next piece of logic. And now we are going to do a virtual transition. And just like that. There's nothing more we have to do. And then we can just keep working like this. So this is going to take another few seconds. So let's wait, let's say, eight seconds until 28 seconds in total have passed. Then we are going to call the graph. 
so we can see the graph change. We're going to give viewers a few seconds to interpret what they just saw. And at the end, we are going to fire off the second graph. Just like that, we now set up our entire production to run off of timecode. We can hit play in viewport. I'd be very surprised if this works on the first try, but uh, here's the hoping. Let's go ahead and select BP master. If I hit mock timecode start all, nothing's going to happen because our different blueprints are not currently live. Uh, luckily, we have, I believe, a default function for that called, um, let's see if I find it. In, uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Let's see here. Yes. So it's, uh, is it this one? Yes. So here we have logic where I, if I call this function, it will set all our different timecode triggers to be live and listening to timecode. Uh, this, this one is not set to be triggerable in the editor, so I either have to make a control panel button or I have to enable call an editor, or I can just forcefully trigger this from console. Call event asterisk px underscore sequences live. Let's go ahead and try to trigger a BP master. So now we start timecode. Don't really see anything happening. Let's uh, let's give this. Let's see if we can trigger this manually. Virtual entry in, virtual entry on. Triggers at two seconds. Let's ensure that this is set to be live. Both of these. Wait. Oh, I see. None of these were actually set to actually trigger the event because you can use the event triggers to trigger events, but you can also use them to play level sequences. Let's go just go ahead and set this and all of them. You know what? I don't have to do this one by one. These are all event triggers, so I can just select all of these at the same time. All of these are going to run events and all of these are supposed to be live, so I don't have to explicitly tell them to be live every single time. I also were in live mode when I did this, so I have to do it one more time. Okay, so now they're all listening to time code because they're live and they're all going to trigger their respective elements and actions when their queue has been rolled over. So now let's play again. Let's select BP master and try to play our mock time code. After two seconds, we can see that we snap to our start position. After eight more seconds, we should hopefully see the animation start playing. Beautiful. At 20 seconds, which is probably still some time out, I probably should have left the clock on the floor. Sorry about that. Yeah, after 20 seconds, we now immediately do a transition to a new position. And then after another six seconds, the graph triggers. And six seconds later, we go to the last graph. All of this is automated. Right now, our entire production is running off timecode. So all you have to do when you go live is hit play, bring it things up in standalone live mode, and everything within Pixitope can be running off of timecode input. And this is how we prefer to work on timecode based productions. We separate things out into separate blueprints. Even we try not to have like giant master blueprints or level sequences where you trigger things once and then there's like a four minute playback, simply because then you can't jump to say three minutes into your production to just rehearse the end. You have to play the whole thing over and over again. It's also is more robust to have things in smaller modules. It makes it easier to offset individual segments of your production by a few frames or if, God forbid, there's a stutter in the audio playback or the timecode in, then the moment we hit the next timecode queue, we are going to resync to timecode. We also have, of course, logic in our BP master to force, for instance, level sequences to sync to the current timecode, but we try to avoid using those as they might cause a visible stutter in a single frame. So this has been our Blueprint baseline system. Uh, for those of you that uh, really want to play around with this today, uh, you can access uh, 
an earlier variant of this, I believe within both the uh, mascot demo scene, as well as I believe the either the exterior or the studio um, example content that you can download from Pixitope Cloud. We are also, again, working on polishing this off and streamlining it before we push out sort of our done baseline system, at which point you'll be able to use that as is when you grab Pixitope. So that has been our baseline system. Let's now, before we wrap up for today and do our questions and answers, we're going to take a quick cursory glance at our at data integration. So what we have set up on this machine is a example use case of data integration, where we are taking in live weather data from a open web API. We are using Node-RED to parse this data and pipe it into Pixitope, where we are using it to drive graphical elements. That is probably going to be in level uh, house, 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 house. There we go. Before we look at how this works, let's look at the end result so it all makes a bit more sense. While this level is opening, I'm also going to don't save this. Mm, no. OK. Let's also go ahead and open our control panel for this particular scene, which is going to be data integration. There we go. So here we can see we have a few input fields. We can select a city either by using this drop down, we can or we can type a city name, and then we can execute or initialize. Let's play our scene and see what happens. Let's actually simulate it so we can see it from a better angle. So here we have a nice looking house at the side of a street. And let's use this to visualize what is the current weather status in say, um, well, that is a intense looking output. Let's give me a second before we start playing with this. Let me just check my settings for this particular scene. It's also a bit aggressively graded, so let's just quickly go ahead and enable color grading and there we go. Okay, so data integration. Let's take a look at what is the current time of day, temperature, and weather in, say, Berlin. We select the city, we hit initialize. And interesting. Oh, I can see that my server over here in the background is not running. Oh, Let's see what's the command for this again. So I'm going to start up Node-RED, which is what we're using to communicate with this API. I'm just quickly going to refresh this in my browser. Let's see what happens now. There we go. Uh, so again, that was a classic pebcac issue. I closed down a bit more than I should have when I was cleaning up and setting up for this session. So okay. So here we can see that we can now easily see the current weather, the time, the temperature, and the, we can visualize the time of day in all cities across the globe. I could also go ahead and type in a city name. Simply hit confirm. And we get that particular city, in, city instead. 
Um, uh, okay. So how does this all actually work? Well, in short, what we are doing is that we are using Varest within Pixtope to pass a query to the weather API. So this query is originating from a blueprint editor called bpjson. So what we have here is, um, let's see, let's look at the data integration uh, blueprints. So what we've done is we simply imported a CSV file, which you can see here on the city list. It's just a data table we grabbed somewhere, which showcases all the different large cities we wish to deal with, together with the latitude and longitude of that particular city. What we are then are doing for our data entity, what we are then are doing with these values is that when you select a particular city, for instance Guangzhou or Hong Kong or Houston, from your control panel. Let's say I select um, Taipei. Within a blueprint, we then simply look up Taipei, which is uh, probably in the T, if I had to guess. There we go. And we grab the latitude and longitude, which is what the weather API uses to return the current weather information. Then, used through BPJSON, there's a lot of parsing and logic here that happens to well, handle our data. But at the end of the day, what's happening is that using, again, the Varest plugin, we are just passing the longitude and latitude for that particular city to our Node-RED uh, interface, which is running on our local machine. That's the service I just had to start, and that's what we're looking at here, which simply receives longitude and latitude in order to contact the weather API and give us the information we're looking for over the net. So Node-RED is a um, beautiful web-based, node-based programming utility. Within here, you can do all kinds of things. You can add, let's see here, you can, under Manage Palette, you can add or install logic for any kind of data integration. You can see there's literally thousands of modules available. If I want to do something with Twitter and get Twitter feeds, I can just search for Twitter and add nodes that will allow me to access Twitter data. If I want to do something with DMX, there's tons of different logic for different DMX utilities to communicate with DMX. If I want to get any kind of YouTube analytics, there's logic for that. If I want to communicate with the JSON database, there's tons of nodes I can add for that. So pretty much no matter what you need to interact with, Node-RED will have a quickly accessible way to facilitate that. We've installed some nodes to already, to which we're seeing being used here to do some of our encoding our logic. Let's walk through this and see what's actually happening. So the first thing happens at the left-hand side, let's click this, is that we are getting a request from Pixelope Director, because our this API goes through the Pixelope Data Hub to communicate between Node-RED and our respective render engines. So again, all the communication goes through the Data Hub, which we'll be seeing later when we're use, accessing this IP address and port from Node-RED in order to access Pixelope Engine. So it was a bit of a segue. So we get a request. And from this request, we are also passing a um, payload, which is going to be the longitude and latitude. This payload is passed on to the next function, where we're simply are using a little bit of logic to generate an URL. These, the weather-based API simply is an URL where we have to add our latitude and longitude to the URL itself, which you can see here. And that's, uh, that is parsed from the payload in, which is coming from the Varus API. And what we are spitting out from this particular node is a finished URL, which has the latitude and longitude baked in. Then the next node is an HTTP request to the API itself, the weather API, where we simply do a call. The URL is the payload from the function before it, where we simply query what's happening in, in this corner of the world at this latitude and longitude. 
what we're going to get back is going to be a string with some data showing what, what's kind of happening in that particular coordinate. In this split node, we grab, first we split the return string from the API based on this particular phrase, time, which is basically a, is a way of parsing a single string to multiple lines of data. And then using the switch node, we just grab whatever is happening on line one and line three, which if I recall correctly, is going to be the data, I don't remember which is which, but this within these lines, we can find the data for the time of day, the temperature, as well as the current weather. So everything else is discarded. We only grab these two lines from the parse data. Uh, this is then passed on to this data value node. So here we actually st we start building a message that we're going to send back into Pixitope using Node-RED. So we're basically starting to assemble the payload, which is going to be used for the, by the blueprints within Pixitope to drive our graphical elements. We, and we have an encode node, which uses our Pixitope protobuf file to well encode the data somehow. I'm not a programmer, so I can't tell you exactly what this node does, does except that we need it. Then this final encoded message is passed on to this particular IP address, which is very familiar. We can see that we're passing, going to pass this message to the IP of the data machine on the port of the data hub. And then we simply spit out this message to this destination IP using UDP. And then within the Pixitope blueprints we made, we have all kinds of logic where we receive this data, uh, which is happening up here underneath event receive data, which we can actually see because the moment I go back into the production tab and jump to a different city, we can see that we receive data, which is then input as a data string. Here we can actually see the whole string if I hold over it. We can see it's a forecast. We can see, we parse everything based on lines. We can see all the different data available. We can see that the city here at, at the, we can see the altitude, the latitude, the longitude, the temperature in Celsius, which is 18.2 degrees. We can even see the wind direction. So if we had lots of grass and foliage effects, we could pipe the wind direction to match the wind of the location. We can see the pressure and humidity. So we could use that to drive fog if we wanted. We can see the clouds which means that we could use that to drive a sky sphere to get correctly looking clouds for that particular city. And we can use this data to take this as far as we'd like. For now, we're only using three elements to drive the name of the city, the temperature, sorry, four data elements, because we're also piping in the current weather as a symbol, as well as rotating our directional light to give us the current time of day. But hopefully it makes sense to you all that with this data, we can drive anything. I could replace this this simple symbol here, this 3D geometry with particle effects like the ones you will be able to see in the exterior demo set that we looked at in the past. So instead of having a rain cloud symbol, we could actually start emitting rain particles, make everything look wet and dark, and have little puddles forming on the ground. So this is just one example of data integration within Pixitope. And this will, after a bit of QA and finishing this, this is still a work in progress, will be made available as example content so you can disassemble it and learn from this particular use case of data integration. Very, very good. So that is our weather data integration. To summarize, it's an example. It's not the only way you can do data integration. In this case, we are using Node-RED, but there's countless, countless ways of accessing this API. And this will be distributed as demo or example content once we've done preliminary QA on it. On that note, I uh, see we've done much better than our previous days. We have almost been on time. We are a little bit over. But we are now going to move on to questions and answers and cover everything that was unclear or the information you would like to have fleshed out a bit after a five minute intermission. It's currently 7.16 p.m. here, so we're going to wait until 7.21 before we'll start answering all your great questions to the best of our ability. Thank you, and I will hope to see all of you again in five minutes.
series. All right, everyone. It is now 7.21, so we're going to wait another 20 seconds to let people come sprinting back to their desks. And then we are going to go ahead and dive into the questions that you all asked. It's not too late, so if there's something that you still have that you're wondering about, feel free to go ahead and ask, and we'll get to it as soon as possible. Okay, so from the top, first question. Has the screen setup changed for today's presentation? I find it very difficult to follow the clicks and the UI capture is a bit fuzzy. I'm sorry to hear that. Nothing should have changed for today. Um, all of, all of, most of our team is also following the feed in different places in Norway. I'm not sure if they've had any issues. Um, it might, but again, the internet is in general all over the world is a bit congested these days. I'm sorry if you had a bad experience, but rest assured you will be able to access the raw recordings very, very in the very near future. So if there was something that was simply too hard to make out, you'll be able to review the recording at your own pace as soon as they are made publicly available. So again, sorry for the inconvenience. Um, We seem to have a few questions uh, saying that the main screen is lagging behind up to 10 seconds. So again, we're sorry about that, but you will have access to a raw recording where everything should be more in sync. We are going to look into this before the next session. Next question is, um, why are we using the PX prefix in all our different events? That's a good question. This is actually part of our style guide. It has to do with naming conventions. It's the same reason why all these blueprints have BP in front. It's the same reason why we prefix levels with LVL, textures with T, um, skeletal meshes with SK. It's just a way to easily identify what the actor or parameter or function is and how we're supposed to interact with it. In particular, for custom events, we use the PX prefix to say that these are the events we wish to be able to access from our control panel. If a custom event does, does not have the PX prefix, then we can assume that it's meant to be used for internal logic in the blueprint, and we're not supposed to be accessing it directly. So there you can see here on the BP master, all the custom events that we're supposed to use for controlling the blueprint as well as triggering particular events have P the PX prefix, where while some of the logic over here on the right-hand side does not have it, because this is more internal logic, which is not to be, supposed to be fired directly. Next question is, hello, does Pixelop allow external slash live data integration, for like for instance, using JSON or something else? Absolutely. That was the last thing we watched with the weather data integration, but you can also use JSON data. I've actually written, mul well, I made multiple JSON parsers within Pixitop itself, just using blueprints, or you could also do the parsing externally and pass each message as a separate string. There's countless ways you can go about doing this, in short. Next question is, EMPS data source integration is coming, question mark. Now, I don't know what EMPS is, but I see somebody has answered it. Let's see here. There are many interfaces possible. Currently, this is passed to Pixitop through Google Protobuf. I'm not sure if EMPS is an option. Currently, for demo purposes, we are using Node-RED, which we just demonstrated. But surely, this kind of data can be converted to JSON or something similar, which we then can use within Pixitop. Next question. Is BP Master already given in the demos? I figured you would ask that. Uh, it is available in the Pixitop example levels. Not all of the baseline blueprints are included there, but the Master BP is, and we are working on getting the full package available to you all. If you want to start playing with our baseline blueprints today, please reach out, and we can just simply ship over a zip of the project as it currently is. It might be a bit 
well, not quite done with the QA yet, but we've used it in several productions. So you can start playing with the way it functions in this current state. Uh, next question. Other than demos, is there a plan to offer a library pre-built, well, a, a library of pre-built blueprints for controllers, or is there an online user-based place to offer this? Uh, I'm not sure what the current status on that is, but in general, our intention is to keep creating utility widgets and templates. The baseline system is just one example of that, and ship all of this together with Pixelor, uh, probably as a separate download because. There's no point bloating the base inst installer, but that's not really for, for me to give a definitive answer on, so don't quote me on that. But yes, the, we are definitely going to keep adding utility widgets and ship them out in a way that makes sense. Next question. For 3D text, is the, a limitation for many existing systems is that they limit text by character count. Is there a way to set a max bounding box and have a max character have a character count limit determined by the font size, proport, proportional characters, and bounding box width? Yes and no. You can do that, but you will have to build a blueprint that has that functionality. It wouldn't really be hard per se, because you have all the parameters you need in order to be able to change this on the fly. You can change your glyph spacing, you can claim, change your glyph size, you can control your glyphs in a 3D text so you can limit it within the boundary box, either by compressing it if you go past the border, or simply by calling the extra glyphs and not running on the screen, or doing some kind of combination on that. We could set up logic where we compress up to 30% and any extra glyph past that is called, for instance. But like many other things within Pixadope, you will have to make your blueprint to do that. But once you've gone to that initial step, you can recycle this logic forever. I think at this point, we we are going to wrap it up. We are going to try to be better at sticking to our time frame. So I think that's what we had for you guys today. Um, okay. So. Before we wrap it up, let's uh, just cover tomorrow. So the next session tomorrow is going to be covering workflow, best practices, style guides, as well as the revision control. How we, how, what is it? How do you use it? And why do you use it? Uh, this is going to be presented by my dear colleague Jonas Beksan, who you all know from yesterday. And it's going to be a great, great deep dive into how to make your creative workflow more efficient. Uh, you have to make your products more readable and robust, as well as how to more easily distribute your graphics between your different render engines and artist machines. That is that is going to be it from us today. We wish you all a terrific rest of this Thursday, and we'll be seeing you again tomorrow. Thank you, and have a good one.